just one word about punctuality. Because <laughs> most people were late. Um, in an academic setting, um, it's not great. In a real world setting, this is the way it works. Um, you know, if you're late to a meeting with a boss, he's going to give you kind of a, a look. If you're late a second time, uh, he may fire you. That's the way it works. Never be late. I had a boss at the SG Cowan. He used to lock the door. Um, so anybody who was late was embarrassed to be getting in. So I used to run by the term, you know, five, 10 minutes early is five minutes late. Always 15 minutes early to wherever you're going to go. Um, and you'll make everybody happy. Um, all right, an introduction, Mr. Eb Oakley. Professor Dr. Eb Oakley. Retired on June 1st. Yes, hallelujah. So, wish him a happy retirement. <laughs> but not really. Yes. <laughs> well, the fact that he's here means he's not really retired. Um, his position was Associate Professor of Legal Studies here at the Robinson College of Business, who worked in my department. He will continue to teach on a part-time basis. Uh, educated at Auburn University, so uh, you know, War Eagle. Where's my War Eagle right there? Okay. Um, BS, Emory University MA in Georgetown University Law School, GD, where he was a staff editor of the tax lawyer. He is a member of the Omicron Delta Capital, uh, Kappa and uh, Phi Eta Sigma. Professor Oakley consults with public and private companies on matters of designing and implementing ethics compliance programs. He also conducts corporate training programs on effective negotiation skills development based on his participation in the Harvard Law School's Teaching Negotiations Workshop. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Uh, it would be presumptuous of me to say they saved the best for last, but they did. <laughs> so, uh, I started out when I was coming over here this morning with the coat and tie on. I lost the tie about halfway over uh, from the parking lot and the jackets over there so I do respect you I started with the coat and tie it's too damn hot to uh, <laughs> to, wear, to wear a tie it's also very humid uh, so uh, I'm delighted to be here with everybody I, I think uh, or I hope at least that you all have had a good program uh, I noticed with the uh, agenda of the items that you've covered several of these uh, you work with Professor Beverly Langford, uh, who does a lot of seminars with me. Uh, Beverly is a communications expert. I understand you had business writing uh, yesterday. That's another form of communications. And what we're going to be doing this morning is talking about your communication skills with others in a matter of, in the context of controversy. And this does not have to be nuclear war controversy. This is any type of controversy that you have in the workplace. When you think about that type of controversy, it could be something as small as how hot is this room going to be? Who is in charge of the thermostat, right? Uh, there are some people who are naturally cold-blooded and they want it burning up. There are some people that want it freezing uh, and the person who is in charge of the thermostat controls that one little element. And you may think, oh, that's not a big deal. But in, in the work environment, that can become a big deal. It can become a burr in the saddle of the person who is freezing or burning up, and they don't have any way to deal with it other than to confront <coughs> that person who is controlling the thermostat. So how do you go about confronting that person in a way that doesn't make you look like a jerk, but that hopefully can produce a win-win situation? Uh, so in the business environment, when we are negotiating, we are dealing with uh, issues as small as a thermostat and as large as our pocketbook in terms of uh, negotiating a starting salary negotiating a raise. Uh, what if uh, you're in an environment as a female that's a male-dominated environment and you feel that you are being discriminated against? How do you address that discrimination before it blows up and becomes a big deal? So when you think about negotiation, you're talking about the whole scope of things. 
and, and we are going to have several different methods to address this in our two and a half hours today. Uh, the first one is I'm going to give you a brief PowerPoint lecture that you have the handouts there. And then we're going to do two negotiation simulations in which you negotiate against one another. I've got the materials here. They're not complex. And we're also going to see uh, a couple of video simulations from the experts in the getting to yes uh, field from Harvard, uh, and, and that people find those vignettes to be quite helpful. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, anytime you have questions, raise your hand. We'll, I'm very informal, uh, and we will talk about the implications of this for you. Uh, let's start with a couple of stereotypes. Uh, the primary stereotype being that actuarial people or people who are, have strong math minds or scientific minds have a very difficult time communicating on controversial matters with others. How many of you think that that, that stereotype, uh, as you know it from your college experience, has some value, has some merit to it? The people that are scientifically inclined, math inclined, have a more difficult time communicating than people who are whatever the left brain, right brain, other half of the other half of the issue is. What do we think? Let's just have a little bit of brief discussion about that. I think that's somewhat true because um, people who are like analytically inclined, they tend to just see things logically as opposed to um, more like how it affects people instead of like it's just exactly the smarter you are the more the the clearer you see things and the clearer you think you're right and the other person has to be wrong because you have this brilliant mathematical mind right and so you have to understand that not everybody is going to be as smart as you not everybody is going to understand things quite as rationally as you do uh, when I teach this course in the, our executive program, uh, I sort of stereotype the students uh, who are 40-year-old executives as either scientific people or people with soft skills. And generally speaking, the people with the hard skills, the computer experts, the engineers, the math people, the actuaries, uh, have a more difficult time getting into this subject matter than the other folks do. Uh, so that's one thing you have to be careful about. Another is that because, and particularly when you get out of school and you're working in the actuarial environment, because it is so technical, so scientific, and you spend so much time in front of a computer screen, when you get out in front of people, which happens as you move up the ladder of the actuarial profession, uh, you, you do not have the same experience that your colleagues who are marketing folks will have had in dealing with people. So you have to be super sensitive to that side of your profession. I remember as a young lawyer, I was with a firm that did lots of business law. That's primarily what we did. I practiced there in that firm for 15 years. At one point, uh, ERISA was passed, 1974. And uh, we, got, uh, we got into the world of pension planning, not only for our firm, but also for our clients. And we work oftentimes with actuaries. I would say that three-fourths of the actuaries that we worked with in our firm could not communicate effectively in an oral sense. Their reports would come out beautiful. But when you bring them to the, to the conference room, to say, what the heck does this mean to the rest of us in the world? They, they had a very difficult time doing it. So if you are uh, analytically inclined, be aware that there might be some weaknesses there uh, and that you need to work through developing those skills. Now, the good news of that is that those skills can be developed. They can be developed through exercise, through practice. If you have an opportunity in your last year in school, I understand most of you are juniors or seniors, if you have an opportunity at your university to take an elective 
in, a, in either the communications department or uh, the business school of, of a negotiations course. Take it. It'll be fun. It's good for you. Uh, and you'll enjoy the heck out of it. Uh, that That is becoming more and more uh, a skill that business schools are realizing people need to have. Let's go through a few slides uh, before we get into the fun part of all of this. If I can make the stuff work here. <laughs> the world of negotiation is a subset of what is known as ADR. That's called Alternative Dispute Resolution. And the alternative is anything on the spectrum short of war. Uh, once you drop the bomb on somebody, you've just uh, deleted the possibility of working this thing out. Uh, but in the business world, the closest thing to war is litigation. I was a business litigator for 15 years. I can tell you that you do not want to resolve your problems with litigation, with lawyers, very expensive, very time consuming. Uh, there's nothing good that comes out of anybody's legal system, whether it's the US or Ghana or England or Germany or Canada, it doesn't matter. Going to litigation is an awful alternative to resolving it yourself. On this end of the spectrum, you have negotiation. The advantage, the super advantage of negotiation to work out your problems is that you have the most control of any of the alternatives over the outcome. You have, in a two-party negotiation, you have at least a 50% chance of controlling the outcome. And if you have thought through this, and prepared properly, it's probably a 75 or 80 percent. So the 80 percent possibility is a damn good option for you. Now, if you can't do it yourself, there are lots of alternatives to it. Some of you may be familiar with the word arbitration. Anybody uh, familiar with arbitration? What it may mean in the business context? Anybody? I think might be like find a third party. Go ahead. Like find a third party to come in and you know, solve the problem. Exactly. When you use an arbitrator, you're using a third party who hopefully is wise, who comes in and resolves the problem for you. What's the advantage of that? Well, you give it to somebody else to solve the problem. What's the disadvantage in a business situation of turning it over to somebody else? Oftentimes you're still going to have to contract the individual, so like the problem may still be there. Exactly. Exactly. Number one, you may not like the result. And if you have given it to somebody else, the result may be crappy. Uh, and you're still going to have to work with the people to work through the issue. And once you've gone through arbitration, it's going to be a pretty tense working environment. I just spent the first two days of this week arbitrating a case on a crop insurance contract in uh, some, a rural area in Tennessee. Uh, and it involved maybe $150,000, $200,000 worth of tobacco insurance contracts that nobody understood. Uh, the farmer thought they were owed another 150000 The insurance company thought that they'd paid them 30000 That was enough. And I was the arbitrator that was selected by both sides to go up there and make a decision. I listened to seven, eight witnesses in the course of a day, and then I ended up making a decision as to which side's interpretation of the contract was right. Now, maybe my decision was wrong. Sometimes it is. You never know. Uh, but most of the time, you can do a better job than I can of resolving that dispute. If it's, an, if it's an insurance contract and you're in the insurance industry, you, somebody, needs to go talk with the customer and try to understand how 
this dispute got there, what can be done to try to resolve it, to take it back from this arbitration litigation back into negotiation. You can always, regardless of what's going on, you can always negotiate your resolution. And any step along the way before the arbitrator rules or before the judge and jury rules in litigation, you can resolve the matter yourself. Yeah, I understand one, you are using a lawyer, you are also using a third party, but it is on your side. Now, when you're using arbitration, is the arbitration neutral or on your side? Totally neutral. I had had no contact with either side. Both sides had lawyers bail at the hearing. They treated me like a quasi-judge, basically. I was acting as a judge and jury. In the case, I was chosen because I had taught insurance uh, law here and had some experience in the contract type matters that were under dispute. Now, as good as I might have been, they would have been a lot better off doing it themselves. So negotiation is almost always preferable. Uh, sometimes you can't. Now, the, re the way you get into arbitration as opposed to litigation is you put a clause in the contract at the time you enter into the contract, whatever it might be, that if we have a dispute, we agree to waive a jury trial in the judicial system and go straight to arbitration. That clause has been found to be enforceable in the U.S. Uh, the rest of the world have been using commercial arbitration, I don't know, 100 years, 75 years maybe. It's becoming more and more popular in the U.S. You will see in your business contracts, you'll see a arbitration provision. What that <coughs> does is effectively takes it away from a judge and jury and puts it in the hands of a business expert. It's a big enough case, there are three arbitrators that serve. So that's the big picture stuff. Now let's talk about negotiation and, and what is the skill set that you need in order to negotiate effectively. <coughs> this is the silver bullet. It's a little book that costs $15. And if you don't, it's actually probably 16 it's up to 16 now. Uh, this is the new revised edition. It's called Getting to Yes. It is the Bible for business people who want to know how to resolve their disputes. This is, uh, it came out of uh, the Harvard Negotiation Center about 25 years ago. Uh, and most of the people that work in this field of academic negotiation have gone through their training program it is a very solid concept that they are pushing. It's easy to read, it's easy to understand, and if you take the time and the discipline to read this little book, uh, you will by definition have a heads up position on virtually everybody else that you work with, particularly in people that are on the analytical or the mathematical side of things. The thought that an actuary would read getting to yes 20 years ago would have been, why? Why would anybody want to do that? Well, the reason is because the sub subtitle is negotiating agreement without giving in. So that's what you want. You want to have an agreement. You don't want to have to give in. How do you get there? We're going to talk just a little bit about it and let you practice it yourself. Now, I, I hesitate to use this stereotype as well, but in business, there is a stereotype that is thought of about female business folks. And there have been books written about the negotiating skill sets of females, uh, and they have generally found with good academic studies that women do not do as well at negotiating as men do. And the primary reason is because they don't ask. Women are, generally speaking, more hesitant to be confrontational than males. 
uh, it works in areas like your first job out of college. If you have a choice between company A or company B, and there's a $3,000 differential, but you want to go to the other company, by and large, women will take the lower salary rather than trying to negotiate the salary and the company themselves. This book called Women Don't Ask uh, was written by a couple of professors that have been out in the real world negotiation and the gender divide. I highly recommend it. It's in almost all school libraries. This is one that you can either buy or uh, use from your library. But it's for those of you who uh, want to explore the divide, just be aware that there is a stereotype about women not negotiating as successfully as men. Uh, a lot of that is based on old stereotypes from two or three generations ago that have not been changed yet. But as long as the stereotype is out there, you need to at least address it. Uh, my generation of lawyers came out of law school was the first generation of female lawyers of any consequence. I went to law school in the early 70s. Uh, probably 10% of my law school class were female. Today, over half the law school classes are female. And, and that uh, is doing wonders towards uh, uh, relieving that stereotype in females in the legal system. Uh, but in the actuarial system, my guess is you're probably still going to be a significant minority as a female in the world of actuaries. Think about what is said in getting to yes. The These are the four main points. You start off typically saying things that you want without ever asking what is the other party's motivation. You've got to start by asking lots of questions when the problem arises. Once you've started to understand what the other side's concerns are, there's a lot easier way to match up your concerns with their concerns. The second aspect of getting to yes is to decide how to invent options that allow you to have a bigger range of possibilities. That concept is known as brainstorming. It's done a lot in the business world. And the typical way it has been done for years in the business world is you'll get a team together around a conference room table and the lead team leader will start off by announcing the issue and their opinion. And then they try to brainstorm. What we found from that method of brainstorming is that by the team leader telling you his or her opinion, that means that nobody is going to be willing to raise their hand and say, that's a dumb idea. Let's look at another approach. Why? Because they're the boss. Yes, you want to be there on time, as Barry indicated, but once you get there, you want to be able to safely open your mouth and not worry about what the consequences are of your brainstorming. That is, by definition, what you're trying to do. So the, the new way that people are trying to brainstorm, which I think is being found to be much more successful, is by using this little tool, by starting an email chain. Somebody on the team says, here is our issue. Let's discuss what are the possibilities for solving this problem. And you, depending on the corporate culture, you can either have anonymous email responses by everybody on the team, or John, Sue, Sam can write their opinions freely because the boss has not yet weighed in. The smart boss will sit there and let their smart young folks come up with their ideas, express them freely, and there's something about the anonymity of uh, an email that allows you to think better, not feel constrained. I don't understand the dynamics of that, but it really does work that way. That's why people say really stupid things in emails 
that they regret they wish they hadn't said them uh, because you're sitting in front of the screen you don't think oh there's another person on the end of this line who's going to be reading this things that you would never ever say to me to my face when you're sitting there at 11.30 at night or 2 a.m. you'll say them because you, have, you forgot that I'm going to be reading them the next day. Anyway, so brainstorming via email change within a team, within a group, are usually very effective methods. Third aspect of getting to yes is one that you guys would feel very, very comfortable with. And that is to utilize objective standards. Rather than saying, I want a 65 inch TV screen for our lobby, you have to ask the question, what size is the lobby? Do we want a screen that's so big that anybody sitting there can't concentrate on what they're trying to do before they go into meetings? Uh, is it an appropriate space there? Uh, what is the standard for sizes of TV screens in lobbies for commercial workspaces. If you can find what that standard is, then you're probably going to get your viewpoint agreed to a lot more. That's pretty simple stuff. It makes sense to lawyers. It makes sense to actuaries. Uh, and you can rely upon somebody's set of standards, do a little bit of research, and you understand what the standards are. The most difficult part of all negotiations is to do the last part, which is separate people from the problem. That is a tricky, tricky, tricky thing to do. If you and I are having a personality dispute, but we need to work together to reach this objective, to separate people from the problem is a very tricky thing. So, that's the essence of getting to yes. I urge you to spend three hours and $16, maybe four hours and $16, to read that book, and you will have an aha moment, I can virtually guarantee you, at the end of it, that will carry you through with your boyfriend and girlfriend, with your parents, with the folks you go to work with, whatever it might be, you'll be one slick negotiator that nobody else will have thought about. So that's the neat thing about this. It's public knowledge, but very few people think about negotiation as an art and a science. They instead think, well, we can speak, we can talk, we can negotiate. Not true. I'm not going to use all of these slides, but I am going to talk just a little bit about this one. Your goal in business is to be a superior negotiator. Maybe not the world's best, because you may not be talented enough to be the world's best negotiator. But you need to be at least better than the average bear in the woods. So how did you get to that point? You look at people who are the good negotiators, and you try to mimic their behavior. And what they've discovered by some really good academic studies of observations of people who are better than the average negotiators is that they do the following things differently than you and I would do. There's a pre-negotiation phase, there's the face-to-face -face phase, and the post-negotiation review. During the planning phase, most importantly, they do not spend more time planning than the average negotiator, but they use that time more effectively. So look at what it is that they spent their time doing. Consider more outcome options. Their mind is expanding, not contracting on the thermostat. Spent more time looking for areas of common ground. What is it that we can agree upon? They thought more about ranges rather than fixed points. Now this is something that you may think is sort of counterintuitive. 
but you're trying to buy a car. Pretty soon, you'll have an opportunity to buy your first car. And you'll go into the dealership, and you'll know that the sticker price is not what you're going to pay. You're going to pay something less than that. And looking up on the internet what the normal discount is for the Honda Accord, you can say the range is about a $3,500 to $3,000 discount off of the face value of the sticker. So if you're anywhere within that range of $3,000 to $3,500, you've got a fair discount. You can take the money, negotiate it, get the best deal, and feel comfortable that within that range you have done fine. It is not mandatory that you get every last penny out of every last negotiation. That's going to make you perceived by your peers and the world as a jerk. And the one thing you don't want in business is to be viewed by everybody as a pain in the rear or a jerk. You do want to feel that you're being treated fairly, and you want to feel that you're treating other people fairly. And that range is what you're trying to achieve. Um, during the negotiations themselves, the superstars made fewer immediate counterproposals. Think about that. You're trying to buy this car. The seller, the dealer, says, we'll, we'll give you a $1,000 discount on the car. If you immediately say, I want a $3,500 discount, you, you have turned this into a bargaining session rather than a negotiation session. The good negotiations, the superior negotiators will say, well, that's interesting. Why did you, how did you come up with that figure of a thousand? Why is it that that is what I should take? And if you get the people talking on the other side, you'll be able to negotiate from a position of strength. If you start off by saying, I hear your offer, but, the word but means I really don't care what your side is. But instead you say, why? Why is it that you want this particular position? Uh, and probably the most important thing that people do that are good negotiators is ask more questions. And the way you ask those questions is you put them together in the planning phase to ask what it is that I'm trying to achieve here, what are the things I need to know? You have information that I don't have. I have information that you don't have. How do we get some of that important information out on the table before we negotiate the deal? By asking questions. Now, if you've got a real dummy on the other side, you ask questions, the dummy tells you everything and doesn't ask you any questions back. But if you don't have a dummy, if you've got a sub person on the other side, I ask you questions, you ask me questions. If I want any information from you, I've got to share it with you. Most of the people that you all are going to be negotiating with in your careers will not be dummies. So better plan on asking questions and sharing information with them. How do you do that? You plan, you plan, you plan. And then there's a bunch of other things. Look at what they, they're talking about. But I think the ask more questions is really at the heart. These are skills that you can learn. Now, if I am trying to play professional baseball, and I face a pitcher that can throw a slider 98 miles an hour, there's no way in the world that I can practice enough to ever hit that ball. It's just not going to happen. I can't do it. But I can learn these things because they are behaviors. Behaviors can be learned. So the, the takeaway from this page 
is that you can get better, you can practice, you can think about it, you can debrief with your colleagues. During post-negotiation, you go to have a lunch with one of your folks at work. What do we do right in that negotiation? What do we do wrong in the negotiation? Those are the kind of things that we do. Okay, you ready to do your first negotiation? <clears throat> this is a salary negotiation between a young worker and their boss. Let me get it. Uh, half of you are going to be bosses, and half of you are going to be young workers who is ready for a raise. Let me make sure I've got the right number of folks. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay, that's perfect. 12 and 12. The front row are going to be the employees. The back row is going to be the boss. I want, once you've read this, I want to talk to the bosses for a few minutes in the back. But I want everybody to spend a few minutes, employees on the front row, some of these are white and some are yellow, it doesn't matter. And the bosses are in the back. We'll also have as around. Well. Okay. Yes. Bosses spend about uh, three or four minutes reading this and let me talk to you in the back.
you breath through this, I want you to make a plan based on the concept or the ideas on, of the pre-negotiation planning as to how you hope that this exercise is going to go. Don't try to wing it without thinking through the kinds of questions you're going to ask, particularly the employee, the front row of people. Think about what it is that you're going to try to do today at the meeting. I'll just come back to the back of the chat.
Okay, you folks ready? Employees, turn around the person directly behind you is who you're going to be negotiating with. You are at the, you are at the office party. You've uh, been playing softball, had a few beers, and you're ready to bring this topic up. If, if some of you want to move over to the other table over there and spread out a little bit, that's fine. Uh, it, somehow this exercise gets a little rough. No fisticuffs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd like to speak to you about, about my salary. As you know, three years ago, uh, well, yeah, I do because I didn't I spread out at this end down here. Um, because we're to the have so I just wanted to know why, I mean, just why you have been you know, putting you giving me a raise. I'm not going to worry about it. 